Hi, this is the overview video for Chapter 7, Work and Kinetic Energy. This is the one of two chapters that we'll be covering this week. We cover Chapter 7 and Chapter 8. You'll have a separate overview video for Chapter 8. Uh, so in Chapter 7, we introduce some of the important definitions uh, as we start to cover energy and next week momentum and general conservation law problem solving strategy. Uh, this is a pretty short two chapter, so I'll just quickly go through. In section 7.1, uh, we cover work, or more precisely the definition of work. There's a physics definition of work, which does connect to uh, what people think of in everyday language as work. But the way we define it mathematically won't feel very... Um, very intuitive. So I do really recommend that you take some time to read the physics definition of work, that it's given by force of vector quantity, dot producted with a displacement. <laughs> uh, it, it's a definition that you will see used in a couple different ways and you will have some um, setting to develop intuitive understanding of it, but the starting place has to be this uh, mathematical definition. So please take some time to get familiarized with it, look through the examples that are in the textbook. Now, uh, one reminder, so this involves a uh, product of vectors, that product. And when we, back in chapter two, the vectors chapter, this is the part that our lecture kind of skipped on, you know, section 2.4 and maybe even 2.3 a little bit. We basically skipped it saying that when we need to cover it later, we will come back and <laughs> cover it. So when you look at the lecture, the lecture will go through this uh, scalar product or the dot product or the inner product in more detail, uh, going over the, the physics definition of the dot product, that is this, connecting it to the component definition of dot product you may have seen in your math classes. So um, it might be a good idea to just uh, reread the section 2.4, watch the lecture videos as a preparation for dealing with the physics topics, uh, the, the work that actually uses this mathematical definition. So, uh, so section 7.1 um, defines work. Uh, gives uh, and the work is defined. So this is the the kind of calculus way of saying it in an algebra based physics class. You would have seen this as force that product with the delta x or delta r, and that would have been however much work was done over that segment of displacement. We are in a calculus based physics class, so that finite segment becomes an infinitesimal displacement. And um, in order to calculate work done over a non-infinitesimal finite path that could be curved, uh, we use integral. So the basic definition of work done over some non-infinitesimal distance of displacement would be this. The infinitesimal amount of work done uh, integrated over the path. And uh, I don't think I have that many examples where the path is anything other than a straight path. But um, it's something to keep in mind that um, as we are in a calculus-based physics class, that um, the tools we introduce can be used to deal with curved paths, uh, any kind of general arbitrary path. So section 7.1 defines work, gives you some examples of calculating work with a constant force, uh, like an example like this, you know, uh, constant force, straight path. That's the kind of the example you would see. Really the complication that you would deal with is the cosine of the angle. That's part of the definition of that product. And this section also talks about the uh, work done by a variable force. Um, in the lectures, we will do that um, alongside the chapter 8. Uh, one example of a variable force that you have in this class is the Hooke's law force, the spring force. And it's really useful as an, another example of a conservative force that we'll cover in chapter 8. So um, you will see the lecture deal with this more in detail in chapter 8. Your textbook does it here, so do take a read through it. And as you look at chapter eight material, you will see that in connection uh, in the lectures again also. 
So that's uh, section 7.1. 7.2 kinetic energy starts out with the definition of kinetic energy. And in the lectures, I give you some alternate ways of covering it. The way I prefer to think of it is I, I introduce uh, energy as a uh, conserved quantity, quantity that's conserved through a lot of different um, physical interactions. Um, your textbook follows the more standard approach in defining energy as capacity to do work. Um, <laughs> I don't like it for logical reasons, but, <laughs> but in any case, um, so your textbook, from the way they approach it, they will define kinetic energy as being given by this formula expression, and then use this uh, formula to prove something that they are going to call work energy theorem covered in the next section. Um, in the lecture, the way I introduce it is, well, energy is the conserved quantity. So, um, so you can go through this theoretical uh, discussion, um, analysis of, okay, how should we define this energy in connection with things moving so that it will be conserved as forces act, as other forms of energy are involved. And then the, as you go through those derivations, the form that happens to work out in non-relativistic scenarios is one half mass times of velocity squared. And I think I've mentioned before how I don't ask you to memorize a lot of formulas. Uh, energy formulas are one of those that you definitely should memorize. Uh, you can probably redrive them, but they are so useful and redriving them every single time is so annoying that I recommend that you memorize it. Kinetic energy is the first one, and in next chapter we'll have energy formulas connected with the potential energy. So yeah. start by memorizing this one, please. <laughs> uh, so that's a kinetic energy. Your textbook gives some examples. This is an interesting example that will be more relevant later in your physics education. Like a um, so momentum, which we haven't covered, it will be covered in chapter 9. When momentum gets covered, um, the way of expressing kinetic energy in terms of momentum, P squared over 2M, that's the way we express kinetic energy all the time in quantum mechanics. Uh, but until then, we won't quite, we'll do 1 half MB squared. That's the form in which I recommend that you memorize it. And you will see this in later parts of your physics education more. Yeah, good of your textbook to mention things out of order, I guess. <laughs> this is the tough thing about introducing things for the first time. You kind of have to think about, oh, what have you learned? What haven't you learned? Um, so your textbook gives a bunch of examples. Let's see what else it covers. Yeah, that, uh, so the out of section 7.2, really the main thing is the formula for kinetic energy. And using this formula, your textbook derives what they call work energy theorem or they prove it, um, and it's really work kinetic energy theorem. And this paragraph here is the proof of that work kinetic energy theorem. And what it, what it really says is this, that net work done gives you the change of kinetic energy. And this will connect to something more fundamentally important to, when it comes to understanding work. So we define the work um, in like the definition, you know, section 7.1 above, we defined it as a force that product with a displacement. And I hope you ask the question, you know, why do we define work that way? And the reason we should define work that way is because work defined that way ends up describing um, change of energy. So when you apply force on something over a distance, you can change its energy um, you might be changing its kinetic energy, and as we'll cover in chapter 8, you might be changing its potential energy. And the, that change of energy um, corresponds to the work done if we define work as force dot product with a displacement. So in the work kinetic energy theorem, what it says is the net work done. Work done by all the forces acting on the object will give you the change of particles kinetic energy. But if you limit it to like a single force, you can talk about uh, energy change of an object due to that one force. And sometimes you, they can be tied to the potential energy that we'll talk about in chapter eight. Um, so this is one kind of uh, more early illustration of how Work changes energy. And you have a lab in which you will also see that demonstrated. So I hope you pay attention and see that. 
Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and this is the connecting the work energy theorem with the V squared formula. That's really the, the amazing thing about the V squared formula. And I guess the work energy theorem in some sense is more general because with the V squared formula, because of the kinematics we are dealing with, we limited us to basically, you know, X axis and Y axis. You apply the V squared formula only to, you know, X axis and Y axis separately. You never really did them together. But, um, you know, in this derivation, I don't think you are ever really limited to the single axis. So, um, so like, uh, you know, in writing V squared formula, if you somehow forgot to limit yourself to a single axis, turns out you still get the right answer. <laughs> That's just how it works. Uh, why is there sign theta? I'm not quite sure about that. But uh, th there is a connection between the V squared formula and the and the work kinetic energy theorem that your textbook is driving. I think the sine theta is just to uh, turn this into height change because they are dealing with the uh, work done by gravitational force only. I think that's what that is. <laughs> so, so yeah. And uh, this example again, your textbook keeps pulling stuff forward. We will cover an example just like this, but in connection with the chapter eight. <laughs> so you'll see that later. <laughs> we do cover that in the lecture, but you know later. And finally, section 7.4, power. This is the last section. Uh, I'll just say this much, which I say also in lecture. We don't really deal with the power in this uh, class, um, mainly because um, there aren't that many kind of in inherent situation where you will just naturally talk about power. So I feel like a lot of the questions we ask that involve power is basically asking you about this definition of power and either giving you or asking you for power ends up being a way to tie it to the amount of work being done or amount of change of energy that's tied to the work being done. But do remember the definition of power that it's uh, average power as the work done during a time interval divided by the time interval. Or, you know, if it's you're, if you want to talk about instantaneous power, then that would be this turned into delta T being infinitesimally short so that, um, so that you know, it, Magic of calculus, <laughs> limit as delta t goes to zero. That's the derivative. Um, so know the definition of power, but uh, we won't use it all that much. Um, but you will see power be referred to more explicitly in physics of 4B. So, um, so it, it is, it, the definition is something you should know. And um, the power itself as a concept will be used in your future physics classes. So that's it for chapter seven. Again, very short chapter. Um, that's why this week we are also covering chapter eight. We're covering both the chapters seven and eight this week. So please look at the chapter eight um, and chapter eight overview video. And until then, bye.